and we need to be organized. When we leave here, we need to have things in our minds about how we're going to carry this forward. Okay, so do you want to start off, please? Yeah, yeah, I want to start off. Uh, yeah. Brian Wadham's Numbies. Oh, sorry about that. Brian uh, Waterman's from the Numbies, uh, commercial fisherman, herring, salmon, and traditional food gatherer all my life. Uh, and it's really an honor to be here with all sectors because, you know, this is something that we challenge with as First Nations people is getting everybody to the room so that we can have a conversation about where we need to go because we all have an interest in not only killing fish but managing it. We need to start thinking about how we're going to create those jobs, not for us today, but for, the, for, for our grandchildren to fish tomorrow. So we need to think outside the box and do that. So, you know, there's a few ideas that we can use that would work for us. I want to use a couple of examples of uh, how we've built relationships with the Numbies. Uh, Orca Sand and Gravel was a good example. You know, we got past the government, uh, or Orca Sand and Gravel didn't bully their way through, in, through policy. They came directly to us as First Nations people and asked if we were interested in de developing a, 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 a business in our territory. We really appreciated that, that respect that was shown to us as First Nations people based on that right that we have in our territories. <coughs> Through that came a really great working relationship with a company. And we still have that company today. We own 12.5% of that. Um, in a year, we'll have, we'll have our share paid off. So that's one example. The other one was the run of the river project that we have in the, in the Kokish Valley. You know, when that, when that company first came into us, they wanted to flood our valley 20 feet. And we just looked at them and said, go away, come back with a better plan. And then we'll sit down and have a conversation. And they did that. So they came back with the run of the river project and one of the greatest things about that is that we both sat down and did our environmental assessment together. They had theirs and we had ours because the number one priority for us was protecting our salmon. So out of that, we got a 25% share of that company. And what happened out of that, we paid it off already. So, you know, there's, there's ways that we could work together as fishermen similar to this. And that's why I'm saying that the examples of building relationships amongst ourselves because we all have that interest. You know, there's a lot of things that I think about. You know, we always really value being the salmon people. It's not about what we do, it's about who we are as First Nations people. So that becomes hugely important to us and understanding that from both sides. You know, we've got to get past this rights and privileges stuff and talk about protection. You know, I, I think about some of the opportunities that are out there now. I mentioned that yesterday, sitting over in the corner is this, is this uh, a working group that we have. It's called IMOG. They have funding to bring a pilot together for the Kwakwakiwak Nations up on the top end of Vancouver Island, bringing all the interest groups together to talk about how we're going to manage resources with, within that within the Kwakwakiwak territory. There's 16 tribes up there, but we want to bring everybody in the commercial fishermen, the forestry, municipalities, everybody that has an interest in, 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 in our territories as a collective. And that includes you, the fishermen. So, how, so you know, what we want to do is create the opportunity so we don't have to fight over fish. First, we have to figure out how we're going to manage it in order to protect it for future generations. So the opportunities are there. And that's that light at the end of the tunnel that was spoke about last night and that really opened my eyes to what I wanted to talk about today in, 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 in relationship to it. You know, we spend far too much time blaming one another about what the problems are instead of trying to figure out a way to solve it. You know, I, you know I've been in so many forums. I, I was a counselor for going on 20 years for our nation. You know, and I sat in forums like these for years and years and years hearing the same conversation over and over and over again and we're still talking about it today. So what I want to see out of this is an action plan of where we're going to go with this. That becomes hugely important to us. 
You know, we've got so much value in the things that we have as people. And I'm talking about both sides, fishermen and First Nations people. You know, one of the things that makes us sad today is that access is becoming way more difficult than it used to be when there was a, a lucrative fish before us. Today, we can't put food on our table for our people because the boats are gone. It's not that there's no fish. We've got no more fishermen. So there's very few of us less. I'm only talking about our community. I'm only talking about our community. You know, so how do we build those relationships? We've got so much training going on in our community. We've probably trained 150 youth in the past three years. And they're still sitting on the shore waiting for a job that we can't provide them. So we've got to start thinking outside the box. When I hear these guys talk about they got no crew. Hey, we've got crew for you. All you got to do is talk to us. All you got to do is talk to us. So I think about those things and, uh, you know, I, I'm getting too old to fight with the people that we have the same interest in. I want to sit down so that we can sit down so that we can understand that our children are going to have the same benefits we have. Because there's, there's a train coming through that tunnel. A light through that, but there's only, there's two of them. One, one of them is a train, and a collision course where there's a tunnel with an opportunity at the end of it. The one we choose is the one we're going to benefit from or, or lose access from. So we have to find a way to get together as First Nations people and industries, especially in our territories. I was involved in uh, a couple of meetings with the stakeholders in the fishing for the M MPAs, and that was really interesting. And I really appreciated the thought that you respected the you know, the food, food security needs in our territories, but we've got to have those conversations. We've got to have those conversations. I went to two meetings and I, I really enjoyed them, you know. We're, we're all fighting the same struggle. And how much is that going to impact us down the road? So, so uh, I got, I'm going to get quirky here. I got a whole list of things I want to talk to, but talk about. But, I, you know, I just want to touch on a few things that I thought was important and I'll back you with bullshit later. Right? <coughs> so. So I just want to talk about those things. You know, it's really important to me to build relationships. We've been trying to do this for so long, so long, especially in our traditional territories. First, you've got to accept it's ours. And then, you've got, and, then, and then we can sit down and talk about how we're going to share it. But first, we've got to figure out how we're going to manage it first. Because the way the government is doing it right now to us is managing to extinction. And we're not happy with that. We're all seeing it. We're all feeling it. So I think about those things. It's like that bone, right? The you know, government's so good, they throw us a bone of policies. We all go jump on it and fight all over it. But the last thing we forget to look at, there's no meat on it. So you know, we've got to think about those things when we're talking, when we're when we're having these discussions. You know, I wanna I wanna see my boy working on your boat. I want to be able to cre create opportunities. I I've trained hundreds of people as a fisherman throughout the years I grew up. I started my first job at 11 years old, getting $10 a week. Man, that was the best time of my life, and I haven't left it. So it's in our blood. It runs through our veins. It's not just, you know, it's the salt water that runs through our veins that, that keeps us there. So I can go on and on and on, but I just want to share a few things and the opportunities that we've already created as nations, trying to build relationships with everybody that has an interest in our territories. So that we can do the same thing as fishermen. You know, that, you know when, when you talk about the government and all the 50 licenses that they give us, we don't benefit from it. It was a strategy for them. All they wanted from us as First Nations people, they didn't care where those licenses went. All they wanted us to sign is to, to sign that dotted line so they could control the First Nations people. you got to remember that. You know, that took us away from that, right? So I, and when I look at when I look at when I look at our community and the amount of people that we have fishing in our community today, they've lost hope. I I had an opportunity to go and do a couple of charters during the Christmas holidays and one just lately with the sea lion hunt just for uh, sampling. I couldn't find a crew. They just didn't want to work anymore. You know, so that breaks my heart when I can walk through my community with a hundred fishermen sitting around the room and not one of them want to come with me. 
So how do we retrain the next generation and show them that there's opportunities in these fisheries so that we can have proof? You know, so it really bothers me. My two boys are trained to be the best skippers, I mean, uh, deckhands in the world. They've gone somewhere else. No opportunities for them in the fishing industry. That breaks my heart. I bought that boat for them, I didn't buy it for them. So, I just want to share a bit of that. And, and I think this room can come together and start talking about management. First, let's figure out how to manage these resources that we're, that we're fighting to kill. Right? <laughs> so that we can do the right thing. Show the government that, hey, we're responsible people. So I'll, I'll just stop there before they club you over the head with the belt. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Now it's Duncan's turn. So, Joy, I just sort of react with my opinions about fishing. Is that, is that about how this goes? Yeah, yeah, you need to tell me where the best spots are. I could do that. <laughs> uh, my name is Duncan Cameron. I'm a fourth generation fisherman from Pender Harbor. Uh, I grew up fishing gillnetting salmon, long lining albit, and fishing rolling kelp. I'm mainly crab and prawn now. Um, I'm going to get to the simple positive part in a second, but I just wanted to be cynical for a minute, um, reflecting on what I heard today. Um, Chris mentioned earlier in the day that 50 licenses wouldn't be released to the nations who lease them. To, to me, I, that, that just sort of dumbfounds me why they wouldn't, wouldn't own those licenses. Why would the Canadian government spend all that money artificially increase licenses so that young harvesters, indigenous or not, could not be independent, and then not even give those licenses out permanently? And so that, I think, for me, keeping that in mind as we go forward with this different policy direction is, that's what they're willing not to do, right? To achieve whatever their objectives may be. Um, so I think we have to stay, stay sharp as we move forward. Th that being said, I think there's a big opportunity here to move forward. I think we need to take stock in all the pieces that are in line. Um, the minister was the chair when this committee was put forward. All the parties agreed to it, are supportive. The province is in support. We have some of the MPs here today that are in support. Um, Ottawa is kind of more in support. The Pacific region seems to be the holdout. Um, so there's a lot of pieces in line here. We have the East Coast supporting us. I, I don't think the iron's getting any hotter than it is right now. And we've identified some of these key recommendations. Um, we've heard a lot of voices, and it's time to just act on these things and get them done. Um, I don't really know. I don't have a whole lot much more to say about that. A lot more wiser people here with better stories than me, but. I, I think we just got to go go ahead with this. I mean, maybe a few things to just watch out for. Some of the like foreign ownership guaranteed when we kick that to Rebecca Reed and Annie, they're going to say, oh, well, that's the BC's department thing. We need to solve a uh, corporate tax law. I'll just go ahead and take care of that one quickly. Uh, and then we can solve this, right? No, the Fisheries Act has to be used to solve these problems. Um, you know, fair sharing of benefits was put up there as a big one. Yep give these fisheries the hammer to enforce those fair sharing agreements that they need, not just talk about it, not say, hey, we can't do that. The Elson case proves that can happen. It's a tool that the Fisheries Act can use now. Um, and then, you know, giving incentives to young harvesters coming in, there's a lot of tangible ways we can do that. Probably better if they just let industry give some of that advice. Um, there's a lot of momentum right now, we can do this. I think everyone's just gotta stay sharp because uh, the department's gonna try and drag their feet and we gotta keep on them, so. Uh, Ken and other members of the committee, we need your help doing that, and everyone's got to stay on top. Hi, my name is Chelsea Ellis. I'm a third generation lobster fisherwoman from the East Coast, but I've been living out on the West Coast for the last eight years, working in the industry, and now I've switched to crab fishing. So uh, it's a good little switch over. It's been really interesting to learn. Um, the similarities and the differences that we have and to really start to understand um, how those things are playing out. Um, I guess my main thing that I've been seeing in the industry from the last uh, few years and what I've heard from Corky and many others uh, this whole last two days, uh, it's about having a unified voice. Um, and that a lot of people here are saying we don't want uh, to have just more talks where something doesn't happen. Uh, I've been very lucky the last year to get opportunities to go to Ottawa and I actually
actually got to sit in with the Federation of Independent Fish Harvesters when they went to some meetings, um, and they are a group that's made up of a large portion of associations there. They have, all have their individual wants, but they work together on their common goals, and they put aside all of, and I've heard they have lots of other disagreements, but they put that aside for the moment, and they all work on what they want. And they are absolutely a force in Ottawa, and it was so inspiring to see how they worked together, and I really want that here for the West Coast as well. Um, we do have our differences here on the West Coast, and we have to be realistic about that and how our fisheries are structured. So as fishermen, we're gonna have other groups to work with on our common goals. It's not just gonna be us working with our other associations who are all independent fishermen like there. We do have other people that are playing within the system, and they have been playing within the rules as well. So we all need to work together. Um, whether, you know, we've gotta to come together on things like MPAs, salmon enhancement, and public perception, and the things that we are working on here today. So whenever I was reading all about the testimonies and the witnesses at FOCO, I did see the BC Seafood Alliance's response to the FOCO recommendations. And the BC Seafood Alliance is uh, another larger group that's made up of a lot of the fisheries associations and uh, different other uh, stakeholders as well. And they had agreements on, on some of the recommendations as well, and they are a big voice in this industry as well. So I got really excited when I read the things that they agreed with because some of them were very important to me as a fisherman and I knew that they were important to other people that I had talked to. So they agreed we need a quota registry, go to mentorship boards, comparative analysis of East and West Coast to start moving forward, financial incentives to independent harvesters such as the fair sharing agreement, um, different types of ways we can do tax incentives, and prioritizing the collection of socioeconomic data. So they also agree that we need a process that will find a common ground among industry participants to consider what kind of industry we want in 10 years. So we do have some consensus and some common goals, and I think we, that's my hope that we can really start to work together on those. And I think we're being put in a position where it's do or die. Work together or we do lose a lot of things that we love and that are important to us. So that's my hope and steps forward for the future that we can start with what we agree on, put our differences aside, and get some shit kicked through the door that we all want. <laughs> Hi, my name is Guy Johnson. I've been a fisherman for over 40 years. Um, in, to me, what I really saw here today, when you, in the past couple of days, when you look at it all, is really, there's a lot of opportunities out here. That window, that door is open. And I think we got to look at how we're going to get through that. You know, when your opponents, when the guys who are absentee, uh, guys leasing out halibut quota or leasing out prawn licenses, they don't want to be in public. They don't want to be defending themselves because they know the public is not going to support 80% lease fees. They're not going to support guys uh, leasing out prawn licenses when sometimes that's coming to 50 or 60% of the growth stock of the value. There's real power in our story of bringing benefits back to active fishermen. We've got a lot more going on for us than they do for them. I think the young fishermen, what they did last year when they went and talked to the federal committee, that was an amazing thing. The amount of publicity that we got in the Globe and Mail, on the television and elsewhere was really impressive. I think we're at a time again where we can push towards that with a much larger voice than just the young fishermen. This is a really broad, wide uh, group here today and I think we can uh, go with that. I think I found it really interesting listening to the examples from the East Coast, from Newfoundland there, of how they work together and also having attended a number of meetings on the East Coast, seeing how effective they are. How when DFO comes into a meeting on the East Coast of the Independent Fish Harvesters, they sit up, they listen, they take notes. When I go into most of the meetings where I'm in here, I mean like today, DFO doesn't even show up, or if they do show up, you know, they're drawing pictures on their paper, they're not paying attention. So I think learning from those examples that we see on the East Coast, we need to speak with one voice, and I think we need to act. I think all of us, like Brian said and others said, there's a point where you need to act. 
and we're really at that point. We got a window that is open. We got to push through that window, push through that door. I think the best roadmap I've seen to bring benefits back to active fishermen and to their coastal communities is a FOPO report that we've got here. I think we got to focus in. We're not going to solve 20 problems, but I think we can solve a number, and that's the opportunity that FOPO gives us, and I think we've got to seize that. Thanks very much. Thank you. So are, are we going to take comments or how does this work now? You have 15 minutes. So we can rebuttal? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, I don't want to restrict comments. I, I, I think that, you know, people want to, um, want to talk about how we move this ahead. I think that's a good thing. I, I, I have one thing to say and, and that is, um, I, Everybody here has spoken about the need to work together. Mm. And, and the need to work together, the need to speak together, and the need to uh, make sure that the things that drive us apart don't stop us from achieving our goal mm. of licensing reform. Mm. And I think licensing reform is one of the things that um, I spoke about to begin with, because licensing reform um, is going to be very difficult. It's going to hurt uh, some fishermen. It's going to benefit other fishermen. But it's also going, in my opinion, to keep the fishing industry going. And what licenses look like five years from now are going to determine who's in and who's out. And if we want to make sure that First Nations are in, not out. If we want to make sure rural, rural co coastal communities are in, that are not out. If we want to sure if that individual fishermen are in as fishermen, not as sharecroppers, then we will drive licensing change in a direction that is fair to the people who want to get out, to retire, yet has hope of the kind of access that we enjoyed when we were young for other fishermen. Climate change, I don't care what anybody says, but we just came through a salmon season where every stock on the coast except the nimkish failed. I was glad to hear about the nimkish. And, <laughs> and every stock in every area, we have disaster on the Fraser. I don't know what we're gonna do in the salmon industry. I, I, I still haven't got my head around it. But, but what I do see is we're going to all need, the future fisheries is likely going to need, in my crystal ball, a basket of fisheries in order to keep fishermen afloat. Right now we're dying the death of a thousand cuts exacerbated by licensing and exacerbated, exacerbated by, uh, by all of the other problems we have. Seals, MPAs, um, all, all the things we call name. No, and no forward looking things like regional salmon development. We all know what all the issues are. We've all been around for a long time. Even the young people have been around for a long time now. And, and if we don't speak with one united voice, even though we come from it from different perspectives, if we don't speak with one united voice, then, then we're not going to move things forward. We move things forward because there was unity in the industry for the need for change. We even forced the Seafood Alliance to agree that there is to be a need for change. So, yeah, so I, th I think that uh, Ernie wants to respond, and then I saw Chris's hand up, and I saw somebody's hand up over here. Just take a couple of questions. Okay. Because we want to give everybody a chance to get out of here earlier, even. Okay, so. We don't want to get out early. <laughs> oh, um, I really appreciate her comments about the Zimkish, and this is what we're talking about. You know, we struggled for 30 years trying to build the Nimkish back up from 200 to 300 fish we had left in there. Now we're up to anywhere from 80,000 to 160,000. 
So this is the commitment that we as a First Nation has, has put in to that Nipkish Valley. So these are the kind of things that we're talking about when we're talking about managing resources. But you know what? We did that with very little funding that come from, from government. We contributed our own money into that valley to protect what little fish we had left. So I really appreciate her comments that that's one of the strongest ones come that come back because of the effort that we put into it.